Um, I think we're about on time. Yes. To start this, so if you uh, don't don't mind, I'll start out with a uh, start out with an introduction. Sure. Small, short, short introduction. So, um, so I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, our our Friday uh, community project speakers. And uh, Richard D'Souza has been kind enough to uh, to to be this weekend's or this week's uh, uh, speaker. Um, Richard was here kind of when I was here. Uh, you were on main campus, I believe, I during was. during the period that we hadn't moved out to North Campus yet. And uh, Correct. I was doing my uh, PhD research out in G.G. Brown, and you were doing your master's work in uh, West Engineering, mm -hmm. which uh, you'll have to come and see it because the towing tank is wonderful. They uh, committed somewhat of a sacrilege by renaming it as West Hall, but it'll always oh, yeah. be West Engineering to us. Um, so Richard, uh, R R Richard has numerous awards, and I'm just going to list a couple of them there. Snamey has recognized him with the Elmer Speary Award, a uh, couple of best papers, the ABS Leonard Awards, and the Czech, uh, Texas Section Lifetime Achievement Award. So um, both this and in the offshore industry and through OTC and SNAMI and the other uh, professional societies, uh, he's been quite active and he's pioneered designs either through his own company or working for some of the uh, majors, I believe, and not Correct. not so not so big. So it's 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 been really quite a quite a career, and uh, we're anxious to anxious to hear from him. So Richard, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, thank you, Armin, uh, and good morning to to everyone. Uh, it's 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 a special treat uh, to be presenting to my fellow Wolverine Naval Architects and. Thank you all for making taking the time to attend. Um, I had uh, originally planned to be presenting in person in March of this year, but then you know COVID happened. So uh, when I volunteered to do this talk, I was unsure as to what my topic would be. Uh, I've done many many presentations on offshore technology on floating production systems and on and on but it just didn't seem to grab me so after much cogitation i decided to that i would take you along my journey which began in michigan in 72 all the way to my retirement in salt lake city to the present time as that span encapsulated the most exciting period in the offshore industry. And I was in the thick of it from start to finish. So the choices I made at certain critical times that were in hindsight the best I could have made, although I simply could not have known it at the time. Some choices were reasoned, others were simply destiny. So the journey was never linear. It was often a roller coaster and buffeted by crosswinds, stormy seas of oil price volatility, which continues to this day, but ultimately very rewarding. And it was all made possible by the naval architecture education I received first as an undergraduate at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, and then as a graduate uh, at Michigan. So that this um, photo that you see here, this grainy photograph was taken in uh, the fall of 73. That's me in the middle with that shock of hair. And uh, two of my fellow classmates from the Indian Institute of Technology that joined me uh, in 73. So um, the question is, how did I end up at Michigan in the first place? So I, I have to rewind to uh, 1969 when I was still in India. There were two seminal events in that year that cemented my uh, resolve to come to America. The first was that I was mesmerized by the moon landing and the technological prowess of Americans to um, have a rocket take off, land men on the moon, and bring them back safely. Uh, the second was Woodstock. 
So in 1972, I applied to the three universities that offered a graduate degree in naval architecture, Berkeley, MIT, and Michigan. I chose Michigan because I was offered a $1,000 scholarship by Rackham, uh, which was the equivalent of about a year's out-of-state tuition at the time. And I arrived in Ann Arbor in the fall of 72 with the proverbial suitcase and $100 in foreign exchange with an admixture of uncertainty and excitement. Fortunately, the um, atmosphere at Ann Arbor was, was very welcoming and I spoke English. It was just not the American kind. I lived in the University Towers for my first year, which was a short walk from the West Engineering Building where the Naval Architecture Department was. I'm sorry. My graduate advisor was um, Professor Horst Nowaki, who informed me that I would be on probation as I was the first graduate student from India in the department. Uh, happily, I got two A's and two B pluses um, in my first semester and I was golden. The professors in the department were legendary back then. Uh, Benford, Couch, Woodward, Parsons, D'Arcangelo. And then there was this apple-cheeked mophead professor fresh from MIT who taught me ship dynamics. That's Professor Bob Beck. He got me hooked on hydrodynamics, even though I was majoring in ship structures. I took Professor Benford's ship economics <clears throat> class, which was a treat, although he redlined all my spellings, which were not done, uh, which were done the English way. I audited NA300 computer aided ship design, which was taught by a PhD candidate, Peter Swift, who asked me to help with grading the course and then handed it over to me. And it turned out to be a lifesaver. Uh, Professor Armand Trosh was a doctoral student at the time. Uh, these were very interesting times when I arrived in 72. We had the US uh, uh, presidential elections. There was President Nixon uh, versus George McGovern. Uh, Nixon winning in a landslide. The Munich Olympics with the awful killings of the Israeli athletes the Watergate hearings, which were televised live in the summer of 73. And I was absolutely riveted by watching how democracy could work and eventually bring down uh, a president, the most powerful man in the United States. It was, it was awesome. There were things like the hash bash, uh, the $5 pot law, uh, the streaking in the dead of winter, which uh, never made any sense. And then there was my introduction to Michigan football at the big house uh, under the stewardship of Bo Schimbeckler and the epic battles with arch enemy Woody Hayes and Ohio State. It's how one becomes a lifelong Wolverine. So I, I would have and should have graduated in 1973, but then came the first oil shock precipitated by the Arab oil embargo and the rise in the cost of a barrel of oil from $4 to $12, resulting in an immediate recession in, in, in the United States. So no one in the marine business was hiring, so I had to stick around for another year. The NA300 uh, teaching assistantship covered my tuition and $700 a month, which was all I needed to hang on for another year and truly savor the campus experience. So ironically, the oil shock of 73 incentivized the offshore industry to continue to find oil in ever deeper waters in the Gulf of Mexico where, la where large pools were being found, but the technology to produce them did not exist. And so began the boom in second generation of drilling rigs. And Houston and New Orleans were the center of the action. This time around, when I applied, I received multiple offers instead of rejections. I picked the small consultancy of Freedy and Goldman 
in New Orleans because they were a naval architect firm run by Mr. Jerome Goldman, a, a, a Wolverine. And they were designing both merchant vessels and the next generation of drilling rigs. Mr. Goldman was a wonderful benefactor to the department uh, and has donated, I believe it was the Robert Lang Center of Engineering. I was fortunate enough to have Walter Michel, uh, a Webby, as my mentor and a brilliant naval architect. So the company was designed, well, we actually invented the revolutionary last ship, an all hatch vessel with the gantry that uh, traversed fore and aft to load and unload 400 ton barges. And it was the precursor of the modern container ship. And it was the reason why uh, the firm of Freedy and Goldman was awarded the Elma Sperry Award. But at the same time, they were pioneering drill ships, semi-submersibles and jack-up drilling rigs. So the pace setter, which you see, um, I'm sort of obscured here, but over there, the pace setter drilling rig, uh, was one of the most successful second generation rig of its time and over two dozen were built. The L780 Jackup was another innovation uh, which was enhanced by the uh, rack chalk uh, invention which enabled the weight, the steel weight of the legs and these are about 300 feet of legs and there's three of them by about 50%. And as a result of that innovation, about uh, several dozens of these jack-up rigs were, were built. So I was the youngest uh, of a dozen odd engineers. We weren't very large and we were punching way above our, our weight as a, as, a, as a company. And I was the only one with computer skills. So I got to create stability, structural, hydrodynamic and mooring software from algorithms created by Walter Michel because none existed at the time. And in so doing, I truly got to understand the fundamentals behind the designs, which stood me in good stead throughout my career. And it was all done in Fortran and punched cards. So there was no place like New Orleans at the time to be young and footloose. And I thoroughly enjoyed the experience and became a lifelong addict of uh, Cajun food. I also got my master's degree in civil engineering from Tulane University taking classes uh, in the evenings. So after four years, at Freedy and Goldman, I knew it was time to move on to Houston, which was rapidly becoming the capital of the oil and gas universe. It was not an easy call because I loved what I was doing and, and the drilling rig business was booming as the price of oil kept, kept climbing. I chose a small consultancy of Pace Marine with about 10 engineers headed by Dick Hollier, an Annapolis grad and John Filson, a Berkeley grad, eschewing offers <clears throat> from much larger companies like Transocean Drilling and Shell, because I like the intimacy of working with fellow naval architects. And uh, they were at the forefront of developing cutting edge software for designing and analyzing drilling rigs. Our main customer at the uh, customers at the time were drilling contractors, and we designed the Pace 80 uh, submersible that you see down here. There were about four of them that were built in the Houston Ship Channel. That's when we still built uh, rigs in in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, uh, and then there was the. Penrod, uh, there were several uh, NA, uh, uh, sorry, the, there were several drilling rigs, the Pace 150 drilling rigs, a very innovative uh, uh, jack up drilling units. Now, as the oil prices continued to, uh, to rise, mostly because of tensions in the Middle East, the industry began eyeing huge reserves in the Arctic. 
So we quickly pivoted uh, to uh, find customers in, in operators like Amico and drilling contractors. And we began to design several bottom founded uh, drilling units. Uh, this was the Amico uh, caisson unit shown over here, uh, as well as uh, floating drilling units in the Chukchi Sea in somewhat deeper waters and uh, production units in the Navarin Basin in up to 150 meters of, of, uh, of water. So Dick made me the director of Arctic engineering, which was nice, but I had a total of about three people <laughs> reporting to me. But in 1985, Placid Oil, uh, uh, a small independent oil company run by the Hunt brothers out of Dallas, Texas, decided to develop a small discovery in 1500 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. They uh, decided to do it by converting a semi-submersible drilling rig um, that uh, was owned by a sister company of theirs, Penrod Drilling, and we at Pace were the their naval architects. So by default, we got to do the conversion of what turned out to be the first floating production system in the deep water Gulf of Mexico and the deepest floating production system uh, at the time. But uh, in 1985, it all came crashing down. When oil prices collapsed from the mid thirties to about $10 as a result of the Saudis flooding the market. It was good for the rest of the country, but it was terrible for the oil producing states. Uh, the layoffs uh, that ensued in the industry was swift and brutal. I was married in 1980 to Rena, a dentist who was getting a PhD at the University of Texas. And we had two young kids when the company that owned us, Jacobs Engineering, a large engineering construction company in, in Pasadena, they told us they, they were going to shut uh, the Pace Marine consultants down. Uh, but we decided, the, the, a group of 10 of us decided we were going to stick together and we turned disaster into opportunity. And so began the next phase of my career as what I call a reluctant entrepreneur. So the, the next period is 1985 through 1999. Um, when we got let go in 1985, uh, we desperately made the rounds over the next month because that's all the time we had to try to convince an established consultancy to take us on. And we finally did succeed with a startup called Omega Marine. Uh, that were doing fixed platforms and topsides, and they knew very little about things that floated. Uh, their president was intrigued, and we had this backlog with the placid uh, floating production systems that we were that we were engineering. Uh, we were able to pull through the topsides for them, and thus was formed Omega Marine Engineering Systems in 1985. The industry remained depressed for five more years. Everybody was hoping that this would be short-lived and things would bounce back. It, it never did. Uh, but we hung on and we actually grew the business into the first multidisciplinary deep water consultancy offering uh, subsea, marine, topsides and installation services. So as the industry recovered, our business and clientele began to grow and we attracted the attention of a large Norwegian engineering and construction contractor called Acker Engineering that was seeking to get a foothold in the US market. They liked our business model and they set up a joint venture called Omega Acker in 1989 and eventually acquired us in 1991. Over the next 10 years, the oil prices remain steady and steadily start to increase. 
And the industry adjusted to this lower for longer oil price and started developing deep water fields in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere. And we being at the very front end were in the thick of it. We grew our business uh, and by 1999, as the manager of the Marine Department of Archer Engineering, uh, I hired about 50 naval architects, but only about six from Michigan. It was, you know, there was, we really had trouble trying to attract uh, Michigan Naval Architects to Houston. And it may have been because the industry broke the faith in 1985 when they hired a lot of Naval Architects and then simply let them go. So in 1996, uh, we won the big prize, the Exxon Diana project. Uh, it was the biggest uh, project in deep water at the time. Uh, and it was to design a massive Hoover, it was called a Hoover, it was Diana Hoover, the Hoover Spar that you've seen here shown in this graphic, suspended over the city of Houston. And I was in one of these buildings, actually the uh, Exxon, this is 1996, there's been a lot more buildings since. Uh, uh, and uh, it, the, the, the base of the, of the moorings covered a, uh, the circle, the diameter of the circle of the anchor points is about uh, uh, two miles. So our success attracted uh, the attention of some bigger fish, this time Paris-based technique that swallowed Acker in 2000. So sticking with 1985 to 199, uh, just to talk about some of the things that, that we were able to accomplish. So during those 15 years, uh, our teams did some amazing projects, advancing many deep water technologies related to floating platforms, mooring systems, and risers, and included many deep water firsts. We engineered the hull and the lateral mooring system of uh, the Shell's auger tension leg platform in a thousand meters of water. Shell had written the book in uh, deep water fixed platforms, but had never done a floating hull and asked our company for help, at which we provided about five engineers and draftsmen to go out there and basically design the auger hull. And that was the first of a series of tension leg platforms that uh, uh, shell uh, designed and built and installed in the Gulf of Mexico over the next 10 years. Uh, the Olga platform was installed in 1994 and is still producing like gangbusters today. We engineered the hull, the deck, the moorings and the riser and subsea systems for Exxon's Diana Hoover project. This was in 1500 meters of water which included uh, the, the third and the largest spar platform ever built. The project was delivered on time and on budget, uh, largely because of Exxon's uh, amazing ability to manage large complex projects. They were masters at it. Um, and it set Acker Engineering up to dominate the spar market for the next 15 years after they were acquired by Technique. One of the projects I was most proud of was Amico's Lihua development in 300 meters in the South China Sea and areas subject to extreme typhoons. And it was one of the most challenging developments uh, at the time. This was in 1993. It involved designing a floating semi-submersible wellhead platform to drill and service the wells, uh, a complex uh, subsea system to gather the production from about 24 wells and direct them via flow lines and risers to a turret moored FPSO. So we had a little bit of everything involved. Uh, and uh, the units were installed in 1996. And I'm happy to say that they are both operating 
to this very day after surviving one, uh, a direct hit by one of the most extreme typhoons ever to hit the South China Sea in two, 2005. So during that time, I, I was responsible for building a world-class deep water field development planning and concept selection capability, which I attribute to being really helped along by my systems engineering background that the Naval Architecture Education provided. Uh, one other thing that I was very proud of, this was more of uh, things that naval architects like, was this multi-service SWAT vessel for global industries. Uh, it was a diving support vessel and it was one of a kind. But in 1999, my interests and the company's direction were diverging and I opted to move on after 22 years with the, with the same group. So my final 15 years in, in 2000 was spent with uh, Halliburton KBR. So in late 1999, uh, Dick Cheney, whom you all know, who, who was then the CEO of Halliburton KBR, uh, recruited me to organically build a world-class deep water capability for, uh, for KBR. These were storied names uh, in the offshore business, one of the biggest oil field services company in the world. Uh, actually, this was not kind of what I had in mind when I first joined the industry. I preferred to stay small, uh, but it's, it's just the way things worked out. Uh, to do the big projects, you had to be part of, of a big company. Uh, the stakes were so high uh, the investments were so great that uh, remaining small uh, sort of cut you out of the action for a lot of the big plays that were going on. Now, the price of oil was starting to rise. It had remained low from 1985 to about 2000, but uh, the demand side was starting to increase, obviously, as China and the developing nations were, were starting to consume more and more oil. Um, and so, and we were finding deeper, we were finding large reserves in deeper and deeper waters down to 3000 meters. Uh, so we were moving inexorably into these deeper water depths despite some geopolitical turbulence uh, of Y2K and 9-11. So over the following five years, I organically built up a multidisciplinary deep water group and put KBR on the map, aided by several major front end and EPC engineering procurement construction projects won by KBR. <clears throat> uh, I bolstered these capabilities by masterminding the acquisition of GVA, Gotovark in Arundal, a Swedish based a uh, world-class semi-submersible designing consultancy, and Enigo, a smaller 25-person integrity management uh, and advanced analysis consultancy that specialized in structural life extension of existing fixed and floating platforms. In 2005, I was named the director of the Houston branch of the consulting brand of KBR, Granhern, and eventually became the managing director of the Global Grand Hearn with offices in London, Moscow, Perth, and Houston, which meant that I was doing a lot of international travel. And I was able to build it into a formidable field development planning player. During this time, I hired about 20 Michigan Naval architects and one aerospace engineer, and they were all very solid. So the uh, ride was not always smooth uh, as KBR suffered huge losses on a project in Brazil. This was the Barracuda Caratinga projects in 2005 and Halliburton spun us off in 2007 in large part to settle a, an asbestos a lawsuit and the related liabilities. 
In 2010, we had the Deepwater Horizon incident, Sorry. Uh, which I think a lot of you were familiar with, uh, and it was a blot on, on our business. Um, but the, uh, the way the industry mobilized to help BP try to contain the spill uh, was unprecedented. Um, and eventually we got it under control, um, but it did interrupt uh, developments in the Gulf of Mexico for close to a year as the regulators kind of took stock and decided to impose more uh, onerous requirements in uh, marine containment and uh, capture of, uh, uh, of spills. So several billion dollars were spent before we were able to get back to business, but things were much, much safer. So there were two major projects that uh, uh, we did at KBR that I'm featuring here. One was the uh, Belanic FPSO. This was for Conico in Indonesia, and it was the first liquefied petroleum uh, gas uh, FPSO in the world. Um, and it had very, very complex top sides. And the hull was a new build, the first that was ever built for a major operator uh, for a floating production storage offloading facility um, in, in, uh, in China. Uh, this was done in, in Dalian. And I sent several of my naval architects there for, for a year while the hull was being, was being built. Uh, the other one is the BP's Thunder Horse. This was at the time uh, the largest semi submersible floating production system with a drilling rig uh, designed. The hull was designed by GVA consultants, and the displacement was 125,000 tons, and it was moored in close to 2,000 meters of water. So in 2014 and 15, we had another one of those oil price, uh, oil price collapses when the price of oil went from $100 a barrel to under $30 a barrel in about six months. And it set the industry into another tailspin. But it also happened to coincide with the, the time I was going to retire from corporate life at the end of 2015 after a wonderful 42 year run. And that collapse uh, signaled the beginning end of the end of the glory years of the deep water industry. It isn't dead, but uh, the years of these big expensive platforms essentially uh, was, it came to an end. So this is one of my favorite uh, photographs uh, that is representative of that era of big, uh, magnificent uh, floating platforms. It's a once in a lifetime aerial view of four of these that were birthed at uh, Kiewit Industries Fabrication Yard near Corpus Christi, Texas, somewhere I think in 2012. The Lucius Spa that you see in the in the middle here on its side, sitting on a heavy lift transport vessel, was built in Finland, as most of the uh, spa hulls were. Uh, then, uh, it of course the spa had to be floated off, towed to the site, upended, uh, you know, fixed ballast put in these soft tanks down at the at the bottom hooked up to the moorings. Uh, and then the top sides had to be lifted on with heavy lift vessels, followed by an extensive period of integrating uh, integration and commissioning. And this was one of the Achilles heels of uh, the spar, even though the low vertical motions uh, enabled it to essentially extend the dry trees, which is what a lot of operators has seemed to like because it offered you more ability to intervene and re-enter wells and do more things uh, down hole. Um, but 
the subsea business was starting to absolutely explode by that time to where the need for dry trees was gradually being phased out as one went into deeper and deeper waters. So the other three hulls, this is the Shell Olympus Tension Lake Platform. This is the Chevron Bigfoot Tension Lake Platform. And this is Chevron's Jack St. Malo Platforms. Um, each of these were built in a Korean yard and the top sides were built in a U.S. yard, typically Kibit or Gulf Island or McDermott, and um, lifted on with these uh, heavy lift devices that were capable of lifting up to a maximum of uh, 10,000 tons. Uh, a considerable distance up in the air and then set on the hulls where everything was then integrated and pre-commissioned prior to sailing out to site and being hooked up to tendons or moorings and commissioned and so on. So the combined production of these four giants was, as you can see, 450,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day uh, which was about 25% of the total production of the, of the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. Their combined displacements, an incredible 460,000 tons, uh, and the capital cost to build these platforms, these four platforms, is around seven billion. So it gives you a sense of how complex and expensive these, uh, these platforms can be. So uh, upon retiring from Houston, I moved to Salt Lake City. Um, and why Salt Lake City, you ask? It was because my wife uh, was hired by the University of Utah to be the inaugural dean of the dental school. I wasn't quite ready to walk away completely from the business, so I started my own consultancy <clears throat> in 2016, which occupied about 20% of my time. The rest was spent checking off my bucket list, like traveling to places uh, in the Amazon, in Alaska, uh, Japan, Portugal, Machu Picchu, and the Galapagos rediscovering drawings, uh, which I used to sketch in, in when I was a lot younger, and uh, gardening. This, this is uh, the latest harvest from, uh, from my garden, tomatoes and, and, and squash and zucchini, uh, and cooking and hiking the wonderful vistas of Salt Lake City, which is truly incredible with my Black Labrador uh, Baloo. I remained active in SNAMI, writing several papers, and as uh, mentioned by Armin earlier, was, uh, was honored as the 19th recipient of the Blakely Smith Medal for Outstanding Achievement in Offshore Engineering at the 2019 convention in Tacoma, where I met a number of uh, Michigan students, several of you hopefully that are attending uh, this, this presentation, and I was impressed by how bright and eager they were. I was also impressed by the department chair Jing Sun's State of the Union, which was strong and made me proud. This year, the paper I presented at the convention on a 25 year technical and historical uh, re retrospective of the semi-submersible FBS was awarded, awarded the ABS Linard Prize for 2020. Unfortunately, the combined impacts of the COVID epidemic, which shrunk demand and an ill-timed oil price war between Russia and the Saudis resulted in a second collapse in oil prices coming hard on the heels of the 2015 collapse, just as prices were starting to rise again. And the glut was so great, the ability to store the oil, uh, you know, there was no place to store the oil where for a brief moment in time, 
uh, producers were actually paying to get rid of the oil and oil prices went into negative territory. And it resulted in yet another reckoning in the oil patch. Oh, sorry. Uh, this giving back to Rackham, you know, I always remember the $1,000 that uh, Rackham offered me as a scholarship, which made it possible for me to come to the States and to Michigan. Uh, so to give back, uh, when I was able to, I, uh, my wife and I set up an endowment that subsidizes the tuition of two graduate students at the University of Michigan in perpetuity. So these are the announcements uh, of the two SNAMI awards with my co-authors uh, on, the, on the left of the Joseph Linard Prize paper. Uh, Shila Ditya, the second from left, is the other uh, Michigan aerospace engineer that I converted to an, a naval architect. Uh, I ran into Professor Beck in the elevator at the conference and he said, it's great to see you, but what happened to your hair? And um, it was okay for him to talk because he still had the same mop uh, as when I first knew him as my professor back in 73. So just uh, speculating about the future of oil and gas, where, where does it go from, from here? Uh, while it does look daunting and the industry is, is uh, reinventing itself, it's down but not out. So what's happening is the operators now uh, are transitioning to a mix of renewable energy and traditional oil and gas. The oil and gas is not going to go away, but it's going to coexist with increasing um, investments in renewable energy. Uh, to be completely independent of oil and gas is going to take a very, very long time. But many countries and companies have set ambitious net zero emissions targets, acknowledging the threat to the environment from, of carbon emissions. So the industry is on its way to becoming leaner and more efficient. And it'll do this by embracing digitization in a, in a big way, it's, it's happening. And of course, offshore renewables are uh, a natural extension of the, of the abilities and the technologies of the offshore oil and, oil and gas business uh, and many of them are pivoting in that, in that direction. This was uh, a slide I presented uh, at the 19 conference on the role and responsibilities of naval architects and ocean engineers uh, in the oil and gas business. And you can see that there are as long as there's a need for things that float and there's, there will always be that need in the offshore business, there will be the need for a naval architect. So while the volatility of the, the industry can be, can be gut-wrenching, the rewards are challenging work, good pay and global travel. So this slide bookends my career. The first semi-submersible floating production system uh, began producing in the North Sea on the Argyle field in 1975 in 80 meters of water uh, from a converted drilling rig. This was just about a year after I joined the industry. The other end is the Shell's Appomattox semi-submersible floating production system, purpose-built, 125,000 tons displacement and moored in, I think it was 2,200 meters of water. 
and everything in between is what I was involved in, in working with. So, and in conclusion now, I have to say unequivocally that none of this would have been possible without the solid foundation I received at Michigan uh, and the wonderful professors that taught me the fundamentals. Uh, you will recognize two of the famous Michigan alums. The third one is not as well known, but uh, an amazing man is Dr. Francis Collins. He was a professor at the, at the universities in the mid eighties. He is now the head of the NIH and is my wife's new boss and Tony Fauci's new boss. Uh, my wife who is appointed director of the National Institute of Dental Research last month. Uh, while at Michigan, I, I think uh, Francis uh, was responsible for sequencing the human genome and for isolating the genes responsible for cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease. So they're doing some amazing things there. Uh, my wife and I will be relocating to Bethesda in January for the next phase of my journey. So thank you all and go blue. Well, Richard, that was really, uh, really interesting and really impressive. I, I enjoyed that a great deal. And as you can see, uh, Bob Beck also comments about my hairstyle too. So we're in the same, we're in the same club. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, we have, we have a good turnout here. We have, uh, we had over 30 participants. So nice. any questions? Earlier in the presentation, you mentioned a decision to leave a company after 22 years because uh, your interests were uh, moving in a different direction than the company was. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on kind of how you uh, developed an idea of where you wanted to go and how you made a decision after so long at that company to uh, move to uh, chart a different path for yourself and to leave that company? A very good question, uh, John. So it, it was not easy. Um, but what was happening was, um, you know, we were now, we had gone from a small independent engineering company. We'd been absorbed by this big Acker Engineering. Uh, they, they had uh, yards in, in Finland. They had fab fabrication yards in, in, uh, uh, in Texas. And um, they were investing in boats to do installation. So the emphasis on pure engineering was, you, you know, was was getting. We were getting a, to be a smaller piece of the of the pie, and were being sort of elbowed out of a lot of the decision making. Uh, some of it was since they owned the uh, uh, rights for the Spar project, and Rama Repola in Finland was was able to build the hulls. Um, we had become a one product company and that simply wasn't my style. I wanted to work on all kinds of floating production systems. I wanted to do field development planning and subsea and, and uh, all the things associated with deep water and keep an open mind and help companies figure out the best solutions for a particular field development. And that was, so that's when I said our, my interests were diverging from that of the company. They were becoming more of a hardware sell products and I was interested in just pure uh, engineering and, and finding solutions. So that was the um, uh, what what prompted me to start looking elsewhere. And my, my first um, thought, and I pursued this for a while, was to start my own company. 
uh, I had the complete trust of the naval architects that I'd hired. They shared my, my beliefs uh, and they were willing to join me. It, it just was, I didn't have the business acumen to make it happen. It, it, you know, I, I just didn't know how to go about it. So when Halliburton came a calling, you know, they had tried to build up their own deep water capability and were very unsuccessful. Uh, there were two people that I knew there very well that sat down with me and said, here's your chance. And, and uh, by the way, we'll give you the opportunity to bring as many of your naval architects to uh, KBR with you. So that's essentially what, um, and I, I was again, a little suspicious of large companies, but KBR at the time had divested itself of its, um, its uh, fabrication yards and, and, uh, and shipyards and boats and so forth. So they were becoming a pure uh, EPC, engineering procurement construction play. And that was more my style. Uh, so that eventually led to that decision to join them. Um, and it was, a, it was a very trying time because I was pulling people away from the previous company I'd worked for many years. And, and they, they realized they had the same uh, needs and desires as I did. So they, they came willingly, but it, it was a difficult, difficult time. And <laughs> Arker's lawyers sent Halliburton lawyers uh, some pretty stiff um, uh, emails about uh, intellectual property and the like, uh, but the Halliburton lawyers were were pretty tough. Uh, they were quite tough themselves, so th that settled in. There was there was no issues. They were worried about the intellectual property and the spars, and I had absolutely no interest in uh, you know going down this path of uh, designing some other products. So. Uh, long story, but uh, it, was, uh, it was one of the most difficult decisions I made. I could have stayed on. I could have done very, very well. Um, but eventually, as, as things turned out, you know, the, the SPAR uh, projects just boomed from 2000 to about 2010. And then eventually, as you know, since they were just a one product company and the semi-submersible and other floating production systems and subsea started to take off uh, and some of the flaws uh, or the, the issues with the spars like having to set decks with heavy lift vessels offshore uh, really started to make companies wonder about the wisdom of using spars. Eventually the spar uh, platform uh, you know, the, the enthusiasm diminished. And uh, by 2012, after Asta Hanstein, uh, they haven't won a single SPAR project and they've dissolved, virtually dissolved uh, the, the group. And uh, I think Rama Repola is, is in mothballs or they're looking for another buyer. Okay, thank you. That was very interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, for uh, your uh, explanation of your long career. Uh, my name is Brian Andrews. I'm a uh, lieutenant in the Coast Guard attending as a graduate student here at Michigan. Um, and I just had a couple questions with your relationship with regulations and regulators. Um, I know you mentioned Deepwater Horizon and kind of the uh, the pushback against the industry from regulators. Uh, but throughout your career, it seemed like there was a constant onslaught of new ideas and new designs that you or other firms were producing at the time. Uh, could you just kind of touch on the relationship that you had uh, with regulators when trying to produce a new design or something that's never been done before? And then uh, kind of looking forward, uh, how, how would that um, look with new emergent technology that's being produced today, uh, whether it's offshore wind or wave generators or uh, just the new energy market. Thank you. Excellent, Brian. Um, and and you're, you're, you're absolutely right because uh, obviously the, it was then the MMS was responsible for um, 
doing multiple things. You know, they were responsible for leasing. They were responsible for uh, making sure that uh, the government got its share of the royalties. They were responsible for making making sure that things were done safely, environmental impact statements and uh, and and the like, and getting the permits. Uh, so the the Coast Guard, uh, and it was very interesting in the early years, in the in the mid to late eighties, when we first started to develop these floating production systems. And I mentioned Placid, uh, which was the very first in the Gulf of Mexico. So it 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 was very confusing. The the regulators were still trying to figure out the the division of responsibilities between the MMS and and the Coast Guard. Uh, and it evolved over time where there was a clear division between the two and the, the Coast Guard took on more of the marine aspects and uh, uh, the, uh, the MMS took on more of the top sides, you know, the process systems uh, aspects. Um, and uh, so the CFRs, uh, you know, they a lot of them were based on the uh, drilling rigs at the time because that was the only reference that the Coast Guard had. Uh, and uh, there were several committees, the API committees uh, that were formed to develop new guidelines. And the classification societies, uh, in particular ABS and, and, and DNB, also got involved in, in developing guidelines. And ABS and Coast Guard work very closely with one another to, uh, to you know, they, they helped each other out basically. It was not essential to classify these loading production platforms. Some chose to, some chose not to. But in general, the Coast Guard looked favorably upon anything that had the stamp from uh, from the Coast Guard on on things that uh, on on the marine side of things, and uh, that seemed to work very well. We were incident free until until Macondo uh, happened, and that was the Deepwater Horizon. But the Macondo was really a failure of uh, things related to drilling, cementing, completion. Uh, not not so much completions, but drilling and cementing and the uh, uh, the blowout preventer. So it, it had to do with the drilling aspects uh, and the mechanical systems associated with drilling and cementing. Um, clearly, the uh, MMS took a black eye as a result of this because the, 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 there was a sense that uh, the, the relationship between the operators and, and the government was getting a little too, too cozy and, and this sort of... Uh, blew it all up. Uh, so I, the, the government then split the MMS into uh, BOEMRE and BSEE, where they split the functions, BSEE for safety and BOEMR was for leasing and, and the royalties. Uh, but the Coast Guard, I think, continued to, um, uh, to stay the course uh, and I, everything that was established back then for floating production systems was was not uh, was not in, in, impacted at all. Uh, with regard to the future, and and this this is an interesting point. The the regulators are always uh, lagging. You know, uh, they have to. They they go by these CFRs, the codes. Uh, that's that's. Uh, uh, they have to stick by by the guidelines or the regulations rather and, and the coast guard actually has the ability to um to enforce the regulations and shut down a project at any time if they so desired so working with the coast guard to uh, make sure that they are brought along and uh, are involved in every aspect of the design and construction and commissioning is very critical and the offshore industry takes that extremely seriously. Uh, and, and the relationship again is, is it's not adversarial, uh, it's just making sure that things are safe because the offshore industry wants things safe because the, the fallout for, from Macondo for BP and the industry and BP in particular was 
um, was horrendous. I mean, uh, they 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 were in the hole for about a hundred billion dollars, and it uh, almost sunk the company. So the consequences of not being safe are, uh, you know, is not just limited to the Coast Guard, but uh, at the MMS, the fallout, but to the to the oil companies themselves. So going forward, I think uh, as I mentioned that. You know the business is going to get leaner and and uh, and smarter and and cleaner towards uh, zero emissions. Um, the Coast Guard will uh, again the things that uh, are in place are applicable, uh, but there there's going to be more emphasis on digitization, and this is one where the industry and the uh, the regulators and the class societies have to collaborate to, um, and there's no, no escaping it. In order to, to succeed in these low oil price environment, the digitization gives you tremendous efficiencies in both capital and operating costs, uh, as well as, uh, and we're, we're ending, we're, we're trending towards normally unmanned units now because uh, one of the biggest safety concerns is flying uh, people on and off platforms, and it's also one of the most uh, the, the biggest uh, operating costs that the industry has to has to take on. So it's happening over in in Europe. The Europeans are taking the lead, uh, and the technology is migrating towards the the Gulf of Mexico. So it it, it is happening. Thank you, sir. That was very insightful. Thanks, Brian. And and just as an aside, I, the Coast Guard was, you know, the the, the biggest. Um, I guess the one that impacted the Coast Guard the most was the Exxon Valdez. Uh, that that was again had nothing to do with offshore. It had to do with the uh, with trading tankers and when it ran a, a ground at Bly Reef and and fouled up the Alaskan coast back in 1989. Uh, there was this huge hue and cry about double hulling, you know, and uh, lots of debate. Uh, the tanker owners, of course, were fighting it all the way because it would raise the cost and uh, the, uh, the regulators stood their ground. And it's a good thing, too, because it's made uh, tanker trading significantly uh, safer and they have been very uh, no no repeat incidents of the Valdez since since then since Open Ninety came into effect. Do we have other other questions? We uh, appreciate these uh, these uh, talks are supposed to take an hour, but certainly if there's other questions, I know. Um, Richard might be available for a little bit more time, but I'm. Sure. Um, we also don't want to impose on him. So, um, other questions, perhaps, and then we can say thank you. Last question. Oh, I have Richard. So let me let me ask a question. So. Uh, sure. <laughs> the uh, SPAR platform seems to be like an ideal sort of uh, system to use for the offshore wind turbines, though they're not nearly as, uh, as large and not nearly as complex. Um, do, you see, do you see how the offshore renewable energy is evolving? Um, would you make any predictions on that based on your experience? I have started to follow what's going on. I, I still think it's it's fertile ground for all kinds of innovation. Uh, uh, there is we can we can take um, uh, we can use the existing technologies that we have, uh, but there's also room to be more creative in in uh, in coming up with. Uh, with designs that you know, I'm, I'm speaking more of these wind, uh, wind offshore wind farms in in, in deeper waters, you know, yes. with 
is where the industry is going right now because you can get, you know, obviously the winds are more consistent and blow more strongly and, uh, uh, and, and you, you know, they, the, these, um, they're building up to uh, 10 or 15 megawatt motors, you know, massive, massive blades. So you're going to need something extremely uh, stable and, and, and um, uh, obviously that doesn't, that remains fairly vertical, not a lot of roll and, and, and pitch. And yes, the spars, the spars are not ideal when it comes to roller pitch. They they do roll and pitch a fair amount. It's the heave that they're very good at minimizing. Uh, the semis, as anything with that's column stabilized, is uh, is better when it comes to uh, these angular motions. They they respond less, so they they're more desirable from that standpoint. But they do heave. Uh, quite a bit more, uh, maybe two times as much as, as, a, as a spar. So uh, I think it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be wide open uh, to, to innovators to decide which way they, they want to go. A lot of this is, you know, is self-installation is a big thing. And the one thing about the spars is they're, they're not geared for self-installation. They need uh, uh, assistance from uh, other other offshore vessels, you know, and that drives the cost up. Column stabilized units, uh, if you design them right, can basically be fitted with these windmills uh, keyside and then be towed out and 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 installed. So there are those benefits that that it that it brings. Um, that's about all I can say. Is I uh, I've worked with all of them. Uh, and I would love to be back in the in the in the business uh, to see if I, you know, I could use my all this experience over the years to come up with something that's uh, that's that's clever and 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 uh, cheap. <laughs> that's the key is 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 getting the cost down uh, because wind power has a ways to go before. Uh, the cost of generating a kilowatt hour is comparable to that of something that uh, a natural uh, gas fire plant uh, can, can do right now. That's probably a factor of three, but it will come down as, as the numbers start to grow. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, other, other uh, questions, comments? Well, I have one question. Uh, when when will when will Michigan beat Ohio State? Is <laughs> we, we've been waiting a long time. And yeah, we, we have to get past Wisconsin tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> good God! <laughs> so this might this might this year this year is going to be perhaps a challenge. Um, but our basketball team. I just was reading in the newspaper yesterday. Our basketball team seems to have the number one recruiting class in the in the country, which is uh, it. surprising. It takes us back to the Fab Five days. Mm -hmm. So um, there might be some. Uh, the, there's always a reason to cheer for Michigan, but there might be particularly this uh, this winter basketball season a little bit more. I might have to switch my closing slide from the big house to Chrysler Arena. <laughs> well, all right. Okay, well, well, Jing, would you like to uh, close this then? Well, I just want to say thank you, Richard. Uh, it's fascinating uh, to hear the stories. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Jing. And thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Armin. So, Richard, hopefully we will see you uh, pretty soon uh, um, on campus back in Ann Arbor. Uh, when you move to uh, Bethesda, it's a little, little closer. You know, I've never been to the uh, to the Naval Arc Department since I moved to the North Campus. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I have to make the trip. Yeah, looking forward to that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Armin. All right. Goodbye. Thank you.
Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. I can't leave.